The story, as she's mentioned, is, is a collection about Massac Beach, about growing up in Massac Beach. And uh, this particular story is about a person who goes out to, a young man who goes out to try to find his younger brother. His younger brother has a drug problem. He disappears for days and he finally um, hacks into his little brother's Facebook account, finds out that he's been actually in communication with a, with a grown man on Dune Road who's pretending to be a 16-year-old. Um, and uh, so he goes out to rescue him. And I wrote the story, as, as Kayla mentioned, it's a collection that go, takes place in Mastic Beach, and there's a lot of different things about growing up in Mastic Beach that I wanted to get across in all of the different stories. And this is one of the stories that I wanted to illustrate what it's like to live in America and be told by a police officer, here's your license, turn around and go back to where you belong. That feeling of... of, of, of you know, not being able to be somewhere because of what your address says. Um, I would imagine it's maybe not something you're familiar with, maybe something you are, that sort of ill treatment. Anyway, I wanted to just um, <clears throat> get fast forward a little bit to where he he's stripped down naked in the dead of winter and he has to sit on the hood of the car. The cop makes him, sort of does a strip search right there on the spot and he starts to think about why he's out there and his brother Jeffrey. So I just wanted to read one or two little quick scenes from there. Uh, his name is Nick. He pulled his knees up to fold the parts of his body not normally exposed into the parts that were. He had the back of his thighs elevated off the trunk. He thought to move to the hood where it was likely still warm from the engine, but he stared into the cop's windshield and thought better of it. Instead, he forced his mind away from the cold again and thought of the ride out. The tree-lined boulevards, the loop through Main Street, and the theater marquee he'd driven past, the old-fashioned bulbs mounted beneath pouring yellow pools onto the sidewalk, as if they'd blink and John F. Kennedy would suddenly be alive, be superb again, be hoisted on shoulders, back before everyone had given up on the cure for death. As he passed the marquee, he was reminded of his first movie, being taken by his father to see Snow White. He was ten, and Jeffrey was six. Nick had begged to see the movie all week. They were between paychecks, so his parents decided to leave Jeffrey home with his mother. On his way out, Nick turned into the doorway and saw Jeffrey's blank face peeking out from behind Mom's legs. Nick started to cry and asked if Jeffrey could come, but they said it was the only way. Shivering now, his mouth stiffening at the jawline, Nick could only remember those few things, Jeffrey's unmoved face staring quizzically back at him while he wept, his father finally putting an end to this dinner theater by shutting the door and the dry taste of popcorn he barely ate. Even in the cold through clenched eyes, he pictured Jeffrey's face staring back at him, blank as lions from the kill. Could there be an afterward after that? The Jeffrey flashes back again to a time Jeffrey is, is hospitalized. Um, and the father wants to know how it happened. Tucked away from his parents all these years. He had a vastly above average IQ. A superior genius rating, said one doctor. And he asked if they hadn't noticed this. They hadn't. Nick's father had actually suspected the opposite. The doctor asked if they'd ever witnessed Jeffrey pick up a violin or sit at the piano and start making sense of it. But they admitted that they, they, admitted that they never had instruments lying around the house. They weren't really music people, Nick's mother said, though that wasn't really what she meant. Nick could offer nothing to the investigation his parents launched after that to get to the bottom of who knew about Jeffrey's genius. The only thing Nick was able to contribute was an instance when they were in elementary school waiting at the bus stop, and fat Danny Euclid was challenging other kids to fight, and Jeffrey told Nick that Danny was the only person he would never fight because he had no triangles. He was only circles. When they boarded the bus, Nick asked him what he meant. Jeffrey, second grade and laughing all the time, went into an explanation of a system of his own making that people are made of shapes, mostly triangles. And you can beat people who have a lot of triangles because triangles are clumsy. He could see when people had triangles and when they didn't, and Fat Danny Euclid didn't. He was all circles, and circles could not be knocked over. No one's ever seen an upside-down circle, have they? When Nick's mother finished listening to the story, she told Nick it sounded idiotic. Nick agreed, except, Nick said, squinting, I still remember that because it's sort of true. So he's driving home now back to Mass Beach after the cops told him to go back to where he belongs. And uh, he just is sort of closing as he's passing um, as he's passing the pond heading into town. He's thinking about what he's been through. Minutes later, Nick was reaching the roundabout where he needed to yield and noticed that the cop had followed him out. He locked stairs with him in the rearview mirror, and the cop nodded to him just as the circle cleared. He parted ways. His body warmed as he blasted the heat and watched the slick surface of twin pond, ponds glide by his passenger window, frozen under a foot of ice. Winter birds waddled with their young through paths cleared by skaters. <coughs> Every star was visible. 
It made everything inside Nick seem immense. Earth, a place to be swallowed. Mastic Beach, a labyrinth. Guilt, anger, love, unavoidable. Life, long. Stars, mighty things to hide between. Waddling birds in their roost, sage in their simplicity. It stuck in his chest to think so. But just then he wanted Jeffrey to run. Run and hide and disappear, even if it meant he would never see him again. Jeffrey wasn't part of the same world. Nick knew this now. He'd break spirits that tried to ground him. It was bigger than all of them. Nick was mistaken to try and find him. For what? And who would he find? And do what? And how would he convince something that had sailed away so long ago to come back over the bridge? To his own destruction. The cop even told him so. He shook his head at how, just hours ago, he was praying to find him. A short while ago, he breathed relief that a cop might be able to find him. Now he couldn't imagine a worse fate. And wasn't that how the world he lived in really was? Always having to wait for a bad thing to happen so it makes way for something potentially good?